Nick, do you think that they're going to kick me out of fellowship next year when they realize that I don't know how to ultrasound? Faye, I have just the perfect resource for you. Check out the OBG Project's second trimester ultrasound atlas. Once you find your pictures, you can take a look at the OBG Project and they'll show you normal and abnormal images so you know exactly what you're looking for. I promise you'll look like a superstar. That sounds great. So the OBG Project is also offering fourth year residents a whole year of their subscription process, OBG First, absolutely free, where you have access to the OBG Second Trimester Ultrasound Atlas, as well as your very own library where you can store readings that you want to go back to. Again, check out our website, creegsovercoffee.com. Look in the sidebar, figure out how you can get OBG First with the Second Trimester Ultrasound Atlas absolutely free for one year as a chief resident. All right, guys, welcome back. This is Faye. This is Nick. And this is Creogs over, over Coffee. Coffee. So today we're going to talk about that wonderful obstetric topic that everybody gets confused by, chorioamunitis and endometritis. I'm still confused about choreo and when to treat, but hopefully after going through all of our learning objectives, I won't be. All right. So those learning objectives, one, we're going to define chorioamnionitis and endometritis. We're going to understand the different causes of fever during labor. And finally, we'll learn when and how to treat these types of infections. So Nick, let's start off with a very basic question, which is what is choreo and what is endometritis? All right. I can handle this one, Faye. Very simply, it's an infection of the chorion, amnion, or both for chorioamnionitis versus an infection of the endometrium for endometritis. Okay, but... But what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I figured that might be the next question. So we can use the term intraamniotic infection because really, again, the inside of the uterus, the amniotic fluid, fetus, umbilical cord, placenta, membranes, any of this stuff can be infected overall. Okay. So that's kind of if you got bacteria in there and that's causing an infection, that's really what all of this is altogether. These infections generally are caused by migration of cervicovaginal flora, bacteria that naturally live in the vagina and cervix, though sometimes this can be caused by maternal bacteremia, which is much less common, or after a procedure like amniocentesis. These infections predictably tend to be polymicrobial, anaerobes, enteric gram-negative bacilli, group B strep, and then you can have things like genital mycoplasmas, ureaplasma, and mycoplasmas as well. Risk factors for chorioamnionitis and endometritis can include longer length of labor, longer length of rupture of membranes, and multiple digital vaginal exams in the setting of rupture of membranes. Others that we don't tend to think about um, but also can be risk factors for choreo and endometritis include cervical insufficiency, nulliparity, meconium stain fluid, internal fetal or uterine contraction monitoring, the presence of other genital tract pathogens such as STIs, group B strep, or BV, alcohol and tobacco use, and of course, like everything else in obstetrics, a previous history of chorioamnionitis endometritis. Faye, let's divide these out for just a second. So let's talk about choreo. Okay. In terms of choreo, I guess the biggest question is why do we care that there's an infection during labor? So, 2 to 5% of term deliveries are complicated by chorioamnionitis, and the reason we care is because it's associated with acute neonatal morbidity, things like pneumonia, meningitis, sepsis, and ultimately death. So bad things for baby that are unacceptable. Actually, treatment of intrapartum infection has led to a tenfold decrease in GBS neonatal sepsis. So we do think that treatment of chorioamnionitis, as well as treatment of GBS colonization does lead to better outcomes for the baby. And of course, we care because it leads to bad outcomes for mom as well. So choreo can actually lead to dysfunctional labor, which will then require increasing interventions, things like C-sections. They can also cause postpartum hemorrhage due to uterine atony. And finally, choreo can lead to endometritis, peritonitis, sepsis, ARDS, and death. So now that we talked about why we care, Nick, how do we actually recognize choreo? Right. So the diagnosis of chorioamnionitis can be made objectively with amniotic culture, gram stain, or both. But I don't know about you, Faye. I've never done any of those things. No, I don't think we actually have time for that. Yeah. So instead, we can kind of separate chorioamnionitis or suspected infection into three categories based on expert opinion. 
isolated maternal fevers, suspected intraamniotic infections, and a confirmed infection. So to start, isolated maternal fevers are defined as a single oral temperature of 39 degrees Celsius or greater, or an oral temperature somewhere between 38 and 38.9 degrees Celsius that persists when the temp is repeated after 30 minutes. So again, either a single oral temperature greater than 39 or a persistent oral temperature between 38 and 38.9, persistent meaning it lasts greater than 30 minutes. Suspected intraamniotic infection, on the other hand, includes maternal fever, as described above, plus another sign like maternal leukocytosis, fetal tachycardia, purulent or malodorous amniotic fluid. The last category is what we've already talked about, which is a confirmed infection, which means that you're having to kind of test that stuff. So I don't know of anybody that actually is doing gram stains intrapartum, but I think most people would recognize chorioamnionitis based off of a clinical suspicion of combination of like fever and those other signs. Faye, lots of people though get fevers intrapartum. I mean, I feel like I see it multiple times a day on our labor floor. Yeah, definitely. You know, do I throw antibiotics at all of them? Like, should I treat all of this? Because it seems like it's so good. Yeah. So there is still this distinction from isolated maternal fever versus clinical suspicion of chorioamnionitis. So first of all, let's just say that there are lots of things that can cause fever intrapartum or immediately postpartum other than chorioamnionitis. So one of the first things is drug fever. And one of the most common things we give people potentially postpartum to stop with their bleeding is misoprostol, and that can certainly cause a fever. The other thing that a lot of women get now during labor that can cause a fever is an epidural. That can cause fever. And then of course, you know, while we're obstetricians and we really want to think about the uterus, we do have to think about all the other organs. So there still can be other sources of infection, like a UTI or a respiratory infection. And so you should still evaluate for those things as well. And finally, labor is a really hard work. It's like running a marathon. So if you're putting someone who's doing a lot of work pushing, they're in a lot of discomfort, and then you put them in a really hot room, that can also cause a fever. So these are all reasons that people can have fever that are not choreo. So based on committee opinion 712, for an isolated maternal fever of 38 to 38.9 degrees, it says that without other clinical criteria indicating infection and without persistent temperature elevation, they say that there's very few data to guide appropriate management of women with these isolated intrapartum fevers in absence of other clinical signs suggesting choreo. You can still consider antibiotics, but whether or not you give these patients antibiotics, you should still definitely communicate to the pediatric team so that they can assess the baby. All right, so Nick, let's say we do have someone who has choreo and we need to treat them with antibiotics. What do you reach for? Yeah, so if we're talking to start about this intrapartum, um, Things that we want to look for are things that, again, control those bacteria that we already talked about, you know, those cervicovaginal flora. So the recommendation from the committee opinion intrapartum is to use ampicillin, 2 grams IV, every six hours, along with gentamicin. And you can dose gentamicin in one of two ways. You can use a 2 milligram per kilogram IV loading dose, followed by 1.5 milligrams per kilogram every eight hours. Or you can use an extended dosing regimen that's 5 milligrams per kilogram IV every 24 hours. Now, some patients may have penicillin allergies, as we've talked about with antibiotics in our other episodes. So for in this instance, with a mild penicillin allergy, meaning a low suspicion for anaphylaxis, you can use cefazolin 2 grams IV every 8 hours along with gentamicin. In a severe penicillin allergy, we switch up the regimen a little bit more. You can use clindamycin 900 milligrams IV every 8 hours or vancomycin 1 gram IV every 12 hours along with gentamicin as we've already described. Okay, Faye. So now that we've talked about antibiotics and we've committed to doing that, we're going to continue to manage labor. We're going to get them delivered. Okay. What do we do once the patient's delivered? It's like, are we done or do we need to keep going with some of this therapy? Yeah. So I feel like even during the course of our residency, this practice has kind of changed. I feel like before we used to give everybody, regardless, 
of what kind of delivery they had, how their fever courses were. We would give everybody 24 hours of antibiotics postpartum. But actually, you don't need to do that. Um, antimicrobial therapy really should be based on risk factors for postpartum endometritis. So for women who deliver vaginally who don't have these other risk factors, they may not actually require more antibiotics postpartum because patients who have vaginal deliveries are less likely to develop endometritis. That being said, if they do have risk factors, then they should get an additional dose. And this would include things like bacteremia as well as persistent fever in that postpartum period. For women undergoing C-sections, at least one additional dose of antimicrobial agents should be given after delivery. You should give them an additional dose of the chosen regimen. So for example, amp and gent in someone who doesn't have a penicillin allergy, plus clindamycin 900 milligrams IV or metronidazole 500 milligrams IV for at least one additional dose. All right, Nick, so we've talked about the intrapartum era. We've talked about chorioamnionitis. We've gotten these patients delivered. What about those people who go home, they come back, and we diagnose them with endometritis? Yeah, so as we said earlier, endometritis is an infection of the endometrium. So this is a little bit different, but similar to chorioamnionitis. Just now it's not the chorion, it's the endometrium. Risk factors for endometritis includes obviously having had chorioamnionitis, but additionally you can have endometritis without chorio with risk factors such as a C-section, prolonged labor, prolonged rupture of membranes, a manual removal of the placenta, and all of the other risk factors that we've already mentioned for chorioamnionitis. The findings associated with endometritis include postpartum fever, tachycardia, uterine tenderness, foul-smelling lochia, and leukocytosis. The treatment overall for endometritis is very similar. The most common therapy for endometritis given is clindamycin and gentamicin. For those that are GBS positive and you're wanting to treat group B strep, you should add ampicillin, and this is commonly known as triple therapy for antibiotics, combination of ampicillin, clindamycin, and gentamicin. Treatment is recommended until the patient is about 24 to 48 hours without a fever. Oral antibiotic therapy after successful parenteral therapy is not required. Randomized controlled trials have actually demonstrated that the use of oral antibiotic therapy for a prolonged period of time afterwards does not improve outcomes beyond just successful IV treatment. Um, if the patient, though, is not getting better after that 24 to 48 hours, if you're still having fevers, if there's still kind of signs or symptoms of infection, you should really look for other sources of infection. Things like retained products of conception can oftentimes be the nidus of source control that you still need to get. All right, Nick. So let's go ahead and summarize everything that we just talked about. Right. So we started off with just Basic definitions, chorioamnionitis, again, meaning an intraamniotic infection, chorion, amnion, fetus, umbilical cord, amniotic fluid, placenta, all of that stuff, um, whereas endometritis is an infection of the endometrium itself, and we usually talk about that in this context as postpartum. These infections are usually polymicrobial cervicovaginal flora, um, but can also be caused by group B strep. The reason we care about chorioamnionitis is that it can cause a lot of bad outcomes for both mom and baby. For baby, it can cause things like acute neonatal morbidity with, through pneumonia, meningitis, sepsis, and of course, death. And for mothers, it can lead to dysfunctional labor requiring increasing interventions, as well as postpartum hemorrhage from uterine atony, and of course, things like endometritis, sepsis, and very rarely, death. Diagnosis of chorioamnionitis by the gold standard is using an amniotic culture, gram stain, or both, but if you're doing this intrapartum, you don't really have the resources or time for that. So oftentimes what we'll do instead is use clinical criteria. You separate the suspicion or diagnosis of chorioamnionitis into three categories. Again, confirmed infection, which requires that testing, a suspected intraamniotic infection that require clinical criteria of a maternal fever plus leukocytosis, fetal or maternal tachycardia, or purulent or malodorous amniotic fluid, or you can just have an isolated maternal temperature where in absence of those symptoms, you have a single oral temperature of 39 or an oral temperature between 38 and 38.9 that persists over 30 minutes. We did talk about the fact that many people can get fevers during their labor course and that not all of the reasons are chorioamnionitis. And so 
We can think about other reasons like misoprostol, epidural use, other sources of infections, and really just being in a hot room. So for an isolated maternal fever of 38 to 38.9 that does not persist without other clinical criteria meeting infection, you can consider antibiotics, but you don't necessarily have to give them, though you should tell the pediatric team about a maternal fever. Intrapartum antibiotics should be ampicillin plus gentamicin. If there's a penicillin allergy, you can substitute in mild allergies, cefazolin for ampicillin, or in severe penicillin allergies, you're going to use the combination of clindamycin or vancomycin along with gent. After the patient has been delivered, you don't necessarily need to continue antimicrobial therapy. Reasons to continue after the patient has delivered is one, they've had a C-section, or they've had a vaginal delivery that has other risk factors including bacteremia or persistent fever postpartum. Endometritis is infection of the endometrium that can occur postpartum. Again, risk factors for this include choreo, cesarean section, prolonged labor, manual removal of the placenta, and all the other risk factors for choreo already. This is going to be diagnosed by a postpartum fever along with signs and symptoms of infection, and treatment is usually clindamycin, gentamicin, and can add ampicillin in the setting of patients who are GBS positive for triple therapy. You want to treat until the patient's 24 to 48 hours afebrile, and there's no utility of adding oral antibiotics beyond that point if the patient's getting better. If the patient's not getting better, look for another source of infection or something like retained POCs. All right, so that brings us to the end of our chorioamnionitis and endometritis topic. This is Faye. This is Nick. And this has been Creogs Over Coffee. So guys, if you liked today's episode, head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, whatever your podcatcher is, give us a five-star rating and review. You can also follow us on social media, on Twitter at Creogs Over Cough One, on Facebook at Creogs Over Coffee, on Instagram at Creogs Over Coffee. And if you want to give us some support and love, you can go onto Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Creogs Over Coffee to support us every month. We have show notes on this episode and every single episode on our website, www.creogsovercoffee.com. If you'd like to hear a specific topic or have a correction for another topic that we did, or you just want to give us a shout out, go ahead and email us at creogsovercoffee at gmail.com. And for those of you heading to Bonita Springs, Florida in January for the APCO Faculty Development Seminar, we'll see you there. Faye and I are giving a workshop on how to create your own podcast and navigate the social media landscape. Check us out. We hope to see you there.